So let's start with the official part. So whatever happened before this is going to be cut out. So this is our new idea. So welcome to the 116th AirHex TV. And um, we have today uh, a few questions. And um, so the first one, I would like to cover some conferences because uh, it was uh, the the high density, high density autumn, right? So first, it started everything in um, Silesia Jack in Katowice. It is in the near of an uh, um, how to call it an, an spaceship. Actually, it looks like a UFO. And uh, it was a nice Java user group, maybe 30 participants, I, I guess, and there uh, were lots of questions regarding serverless. And uh, the participants already did some serverless, so it was a nice conversation. The next the next conference was DevOps, and the funny part, right? Um, my Lufthansa account somehow stopped working because of technical reasons, so I, I couldn't log in. So I traveled by train, which was the best decision ever. I, th I thought it was hardly doable, but it was. So uh, I had a lot of time, you know, to work actually in the train. So this worked well, and DevOx was great. And um, and uh, yeah, I of course uh, talk a bit about clouds and serverless, and uh, yeah. And um, why I'm talking so so much about serverless? Because um, right now I get lots, uh, many projects complain that uh, cloud is expensive and they are running basically virtual machines in the cloud. So with Java, it is possible to do something to to to, to uh, see cloud differently, and um, this is why I think serverless is like Java E in the cloud, right? So this was the continuation. Uh, wow, he uh, says uh, thirty-four Celsius in Paraguay, and uh, they have forty-five uh, uh, degrees in summer. Okay, forty-five in summer. Sometimes in Germany as well, but uh, 34 Celsius in Paraguay right now is, is not bad, actually. Okay, DevOps was great. Uh, the next one was, uh, was uh, this was interesting, Java user, group, Java user Group Oberpfalz. This is here near in Germany. And um, uh, Bavarian Forest, actually. And uh, what, uh, what, we, what we did, it was actually Java Haters Meetup. So uh, there, there were Python and... Node.js people and they try to criticize Java and I try to convince them or quite didn't try to convince them I just answered questions and uh, the uh, what what happened then is there was one professor who uh, teached uh, Python and he asked me you know uh, uh, why uh, wh whether it were possible to uh, show how actually how how to learn Java right so uh, we will do it next summer at the university a session, Java user group uh, session about Java, and they will switch to Java, so which is which is interesting, right? Because uh, no poor stu students, I would say Python is way too complicated to learn, so I, I, they, they they will have more vacations with Java, of course, right? So this is what will happen. Um, so uh, Java, this this was actually nice because there are lots of people, no, lots of. Um, Lots of uh, developers without any Java experience, and they ask a lot. They say Java is too complicated. Java is now not well suited for, for scripting. So I showed some code, and yeah, what was also great, better than expected, was the Eclipse Con, and I only attended the community day. So and what I did is in the talk, I said, okay, if you stay on premise, what you can do, and what you can do in the cloud. So there are two opposite architectures, which I described, and uh, actually Basel one. This was uh, also an, uh, unexpected. The Basel one happens in a kind of a, it looks like, it is hard to explain. It is a huge, it looks like a mall, but in the in the middle of the mall is actually a food area. So there is no the food for of all over the world. And um in the, I would say in the in the in the outside area, there are the conference rooms. So it was and the coffee was exceptionally good. So I think I have to say the Basel one is the best coffee ever. So if you are attending con conferences just in order to drink coffee, what I'm doing actually, so uh, I'm just you know, selecting the conferences according to you know, the quality of the co uh, coffee. So the Basel one was the best one. And, um, and I did a workshop. Um, and the interesting part in the workshop, I tried to explain serverless and um, there was the deal with the attendees. 
I will explain so long that uh, as long as needed that they have complete understanding about serverless. And it took over one hour, I think. And then I got idea how to explain it. And I tried uh, at the conference. At the next conference, which was Geekon, exactly. So I, I created in, in train some slides. And I explained serverless with mod JK on mod proxy, which was fun. So And this worked, I hope, better. Geekon, also great. And by the way, if you would like to see so, so some general um, impressions, how the conference looked like, what I did, I record, I record per conference like a one-minute short with some you know, impressions. So you can see, I, I think Basel 1 was not released yet, so I'm not sure, but I recorded one. Uh, Geekon, I think, is out. The uh, InfoShare is out and, uh, and uh, DevOx as well. Then InfoShare Katowice again. So there was a workshop and a session. Also, also I mean, from, from the venue, I think in Katowice was the best one ever. It looked like it it was it is um, exceptional, nice and beautiful venue, I would say, and in the near of the spaceship with uh, some plus points. Coffee, I think, was not that good at Katowice, unfortunately, but outside it was, but not in the in the building. So, and um, and at JDD, okay. <laughs> JDD is conference uh, with some with some history, I would say, because uh, yeah, um, as I already reported here at, at the AHEX, uh, what happens is I uh, I um, delivered a talk. The future is now with Java. E. It was ten years ago, and ten years later, I was invited back and uh, try to uh, you know to uh, to compare what I said ten years ago to now, and uh, it happened again. So because uh, last year they asked me to record a short to promote my talk. And since then, I'm actually recording the shorts. So this was also a historical moment, you know, like one year with shorts. Okay, this basically was, there was another, it was actually similar talks. I just, you know, changed them a bit, but I did the same in the uh, north of Poland. And, um, and now uh, the next talk is Java User Group Vienna, if you like. It is going to be at the beginning of December in Vienna. And I think I'm done with conference, or at least public one. There will be some internal, but public one. Uh, so I'm. So people were actually, after that, I was, um, people said, okay, the first time they saw me you know, in person because they already suspected you just know AI online or I'm already dead and you know, I left Java. So this was the report, autumn report of conferences. And maybe we should start now with the show, or not not the show, with um, with questions and topics. And uh, the first one is from Krizu, and uh, it's this excellent question actually. And I thought about about this. It's like actually, what you you are right, but how I am doing this, and this is the interesting actually answer because what Krizu asked me is what I'm actually doing all the time without thinking about this. So um and also interesting um I also plan or plan I already uh, uh submitted I was asked to deliver a keynote um and uh, next year at the conference I would deliver a keynote with the title it will be somehow you know what is cloud native or what cloud cloud native means, and what I what I plan to do is to explain you know um, if you ship something to the cloud how to automate the resource and so forth, and one of the things is that usually all the cloud native resources are accessible via HTTP, so and if they are accessible via HTTP, authentication and authorization also happens via HTTP, and this is part of the question from Kriso, which is why the question is so good. So what what it means is. The easiest uh, way to to have machine to machine communication is as the the I would say the 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 how to call it the foundation of the entire thing is uh, wait a sec there is somewhere not this this is also but this is actually the underpinning or the foundation of the entire I would say security almost at, on AWS. And I don't know whether you remember, 
But at the beginning of the clouds, what uh, um, there was a discussion regarding, you know, HTTP that all the resources have to be, you know, accessible via HTTP. There was a big topic, and the next topic was how to authenticate. And back then, the AWS got the idea to to calculate uh, or to to um, to 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 create a signature, yeah, to calculate a signature from the entire HTTP request, which had as everything, and uh, and add, you know, your credentials to it and use it for authentication. And this is how this works. So what it means is the machine-to-machine -machine communication will be usually based on the, um, the signature v4, but you don't have to do it. So this is what usually happens in the SDKs, software development kits. So if you are using, let's say, if you're accessing for Lambda and S3, this is what Lambda is doing. So what Lambda is doing, for instance, the Lambda assumes a role, which is short-lived credential. It's very similar to a user, but it's short-lived. And uh, and then for, I don't know, a few minutes, 15 minutes usually, the Lambda is able to communicate with S3. S3 is machine, Lambda is a machine, there is no user involved. So between Lambda and the S3, we already have machine-to-machine -machine communication because the S3 is also an, an HTTP API, right? Now, this is... You know the low. And by the way, you could even implement the um, the signature v4. It is well specified in Java to, for your project, if you like. Now, um, what you can do on AWS as well. There is a SDS. This is a security token ser service. I thought this is this secure token service, but this is a security token service. And with that, you can create you know the uh, the credentials, short-lived credentials on the fly. Which is uh, often used, you know, to if you would like to switch role or something like this. So you could also use the SDS between services to get uh, a token to assume a role, and then one service will call the other service. So this is um, this what, for instance, sometimes we did in the pipelines. So if an CI/CD pipelines with with that. Uh, the pipelines ru runs already in a role, but with STS you can assume another role to access something, and then you fall back to the you know pre previous previously assumed role. I would say the CI/CD pipeline and the other service is also kind of machine-to-machine -machine communication because there's no user involved. The pipeline is triggered by GitHub, runs you know autonomously, and it and it calls another service. So this is also machine-to-machine -machine communication. So now, but what you may and and so what it basically means is if you are in Lambda or EC2 machine or whatever on AWS, usually you are communicating with other services using short-lived credentials. And short-lived credentials uh, you usually get with roles, not with users, because the, the, you know, the difference between user and the role is user, uh, the credentials are, uh, are, are valid forever. And the role is just, you know, the credentials, you get the credentials and then they disappear after a while. So th this is maybe the, the, the difference. And um, so if you if you use AWS uh, EC2, AWS Lambda, Fargate, and you have a Fargate and you access an external, so SNS, SQS, or whatever, this is machine-to-machine -machine communication with the technologies we described. Now, uh, so this is the, um, the STS. So the chat is very quiet which is suspicious, but could be. So uh, may maybe you know the topic is so so exciting. So we have the SDS, and then, um, and then you also ask Lambda. So the interesting part is, so if you have, you know, to a Lambda expose uh, with function URL, which is the simplest possible way, simplest possible thing, right? Uh, then this Lambda has two authentication types. One is called... Um, AWS IAM and the other one is none. And the AWS IAM means um, you will have to to have a role which is allowed to access the Lambda. So you get very basic machine machine to machine again authentication with Lambda. So it means if the role is allowed to invoke the Ram, uh, Lambda, I think the permission is invoke invoke action or something like this. Then you are allowed. And by the way, by the way. If you uh, expose the Lambda with via HTTP API gateway, HTTP A, HTTP A, A <laughs> HTTP API gateway, um, it also accesses the Lambda. It also needs the same permission, by the way. This HTTP API gateway is a machine, 
And Lambda is a machine, machine to machine communication. And what you should avoid is um, Lambda to Lambda communication because you get cascading invocations. It takes a long time and, um, and you will pay more, right? So, but if your Lambda writes something to an SQS and the message is passed to another Lambda, so this SQS also needs permission to invoke the other Lambda. Now, the question is, uh, if the if you would like to encode in the in the message the user information, you can pass a JSON web token, and you can get the JSON web token from uh, it's already suggested from the um, from the uh, Cognito uh, and uh, also AWS um, uh, application load balancer AWS can uh, create uh, tokens and HTTP API gateway indirectly with Lambda authorizers as well. So this was a long answer, but uh, the interesting part is, if you just create simple code in the cloud, uh, it's already solved. But if you deploy the two virtual machines, which are not using the cloud at all, now you have the problem because you have two machines with, in, you know, and now how they have to communicate and, and, and w w the, the entire mechanism I, I ex described right now uh, doesn't work anymore because the machines are not communicating with, via HTTP, maybe it's a GDBC call or Kafka, Zocket or whatever. So, but as long as you're using cloud native resources like SNS, SQS, Kinesis, DynamoDB, then everything works you know, in the same way. So uh, in one cluster in the same, I have here a heart, so I cannot see what's behind the heart. So I give you the heart, okay? Now it still doesn't disappear. So um, do we need out the query between two services in one cluster in same namespace? I don't know what namespace means. There are no namespace in the clouds. Maybe you mean sec uh, the Kubernetes. Then we have to look up you know, Kubernetes way. I have to say um, for several years, we are eliminating Kubernetes because of costs actually, and uh, or we. Uh, I get asked, you know, by companies, okay, can we do something about the costs? And usually, if in enterprise space, if you migrate to serverless with Quarkus or similar or Micronaut, then uh, it you can save money. So, and and this is now about saving money these days. Um, okay, I hope we cover this topic. Um, and why I also like the topic because, um, no kidding. Um, after the question, I actually. Um, so because there is a, a workshop in uh, December, AWS Security Authentication Authorization, I created three slides just because of that. I will create also some code because um, without the question, I would forget about that. So, so it was an excellent question and it will be also the part of the of the workshop. So I will also refer to the question and and create some examples and, uh, and some slides. So I'm already on it. So thank you for the question. It, it, it looks almost like stage, right? No, I, I would pay Krizu to ask the question in order to promote my workshop, but it was an accident. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I think we covered function URL. And by the way, function URL is perfect for that case for machine-to-machine -machine communication. The only downside is the function URLs uh, are publicly available always. So uh, you cannot run them in private subnet. That's a problem. Okay. Now let's see what we have here. Ah, Krizu, I will be there. Perfect, Krizu. So uh, then you influence, you know, the agenda. Um, thank you. Um, and uh, Cognito, yes, Cognito is great with OAuth. You can create the OAuth um, or or Open ID Connect rather than uh, uh, flows and. Um, what I even did, um, I extended Quarkus or extended, I submitted a patch or, or, or pull request so that Quarkus understands um, application load balancer tokens. So Krizu, if you are working uh, in, uh, in uh, Kubernetes, you could actually use recent Quarkus and Quarkus will understand the tokens uh, created by application load balancer ALB. Um, yeah. This could help you because you, uh, the application load balancer from AWS doesn't create standard tokens. Um, the problem is, uh, what is the problem? Uh, after every, how to call it, the token comprises three parts. And after every part, 
there is one, uh, I think there is a semicolon or something, which is not standard, and uh, Quarkus complained, but this is solved. And also the uh, key rotation is dynamic, but now it is solved. So it is in the recent Quarkus, it is solved. Uh, what I also would like to make is the configuration a little bit more simpler, one-liner, but uh, I only need three hours or something and uh, free time and it will happen. Okay, I hope the first question is answered. So, and the next one is similar and I hope it is already answered because you ask me, uh, you, uh, you ask me if a machine client needs access REST API, but also S3 and SNS. So if you, it accesses your REST API and this is function URL, then it will be nice because the rest your function URL REST API S3 and NS SNS could be the same role, so um, it 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 could work right, and um, this is now I am basic, but you have basics, but uh, you could use so called resource policy. So resource policies are attached to uh, to the function URL or S3 or SNS, or you can use the. Um, the opposite, I think, is called identity-based policy. So what it means is uh, you are allowing the principal to do stuff. Um, it sounds complicated, but this is actually a, the, you know, the basic security at, at AWS. This is how it works, you know, communication between services. The problem is, of course, if you would, let's say, just put your on Docker container to Kubernetes and the Kubernetes doesn't participate, you know, in the entire IAM uh, mechanism, then you have to implement something, right? But uh, the idea is, my idea is, you know, to use the cloud as much as possible, and then it works out of the box, more or less. Uh, yeah, S3 bucket, SNS topic, SQS, Kinesis would be always the same. Uh, pre sign URL for S3, yeah, you can use that, but this is like pre sign URL is the, in the URI, you have, you know, the, the principle, and you can call it, but uh, but SNS doesn't know not anything, yeah? But... Um, if you have, um, so what I don't understand here, if you access SNS or SQS, you have to use the SDK. And if you use the SDK, the credentials are passed to SNS. So what you only need is a role to access that, right? Um, yeah, and Cognito Identity Pool or User Pool. So Cognito Identity Pool means you are working with uh, IAM users and User Pool could be interesting. So there are external users. So both would work. And last question from Krizu is uh, whether I like Antora. And I didn't use Antora. I used uh, ASCII doc. But what I know, lots of projects are using Antora for documentation purposes. And I think this is the way to go because, um, because if you go, where was it? Um, if you go to docs, I think. What you will find, here, yeah. this is Mr. Dan Allen, uh, also known as Mojave Linux. And then we had uh, we spent a lot of time together. Java ones, early Java ones. Then was about. Uh, he he was uh, big into CDI back then, so he he spent lots of time with. Uh, dependency injection and I asked him um, why your handle is Mojave Linux and he told me because I learned programming at the Mojave uh, Mojave uh, Desert so a really nice guy and then um, he quit I think Red Hat and then start and, and really contributed a lot to open source project to ASCII doc and uh, now he spent time with Anthora so I would say you know um, usually if Dennis Behind something, it it is he will try you know to he's really persistent what he does. So I was and and I already heard only good things about Antora. I, I didn't use Antora by myself, but uh, if there's something to choose, you know, take a look at Antora and 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 the other. But you see this, uh, he is a really um, well known guy with from from Askedoc perspective. So I would say Antora is. Uh, possibly or highly possibly uh, possible is the, the best best choice. Okay. Uh, now, there was one, because I was so late, uh, maybe, 
Why I announced the, sh the show at all is because in uh, the um, in the Discord I got uh, from Jerry, friend friend of the show. I uh, I got a question, you know, regarding the the air hacks, um, um, about Quarkus and Snapstart, and I thought this is uh, nice that the first question was on Discord, and then took a look and I f and said, oh, but there is it was asked by Discord because I I forgot to announce it on on on, on GitHub. And his question is that uh, the Quark and he and the Jerry, Jerry DK is his handle. And by the way, if you like to just join the Discord group, there's open the the, uh, the uh, this is the Airhex server. So this is Airhex. If you go to Discord Airhex, you will find it. And um, what he asked is he experimented with Azul. This is Zulu JDK. And um, and by the way, Zulu JDK. I wanted to show you something. Because uh, at the conference, I met the uh, Azul people as well. Inventory, code inventory. Yes. Uh, if you have already contract with um, with Azul systems, and you are using the Zulu JDK. What's interesting, there's a proprietary commercial feature, but it's really interesting. What it does is, um, when Zulu runs your code, you can ask Zulu afterwards how much of the code uh, was used, like code coverage. It's built-in code coverage tool. So if you have migration project, you can run uh, you can run old project on Zulu and then run the tests against that, and you will find oh uh, this you know these subsystems were never used, so we 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 don't migrate them. And um, what I used um, prior, I never, I didn't use this in, I didn't try this yet. But what I did instead, I usually run, you know, the code with code coverage, even sometimes in production to find out to you know what is actually used. But uh, Zulu ships this out of the box. I thought this is actually interesting because um, interesting example of added value by particular Java, uh, Java virtual machine, right? Okay, so but this was completely off topic, of course, uh, as always here. Yeah. And uh, where we wh why I mentioned now uh, Zulu, I actually completely forgot. Uh, then Alan was <laughs> Antora. Uh, this was Zulu, exactly. This was one thing, and the Snapstart, exactly. So uh, the the uh, the Snapstart. This was this was the, the thing. The uh, Jerry tried Snapstart on Zulu. And uh, on Azul systems, and find out that uh, the uh, JDBC Postgres JDBC driver has problems because it uh, if it freezes the the, the image, the um, gets uh, the, gets problem with the sockets, and um, and the feedback from Zulu was uh, it is known issue and Quarkus uh, does not support does not support crack. This is uh, crack is is. Coordinated resource at checkpoint. I think the first time I remembered what R means, I always uh, I always think a coordinated resource at checkpoint does make this is restore at checkpoint. So, but I I never use uh, Quarkus with crack. But what I use is Quarkus with Snapstart, which is similar. And um, interestingly, in the cloud you don't have such problems. Why not? Because Quark actually you have reverse problem. What we have to do is in Quarkus. Um, in a static block or on the crack hook, we are actually loading as much classes as possible. So we are uh, we are hitting uh, from, for instance, from the uh, DynamoDB or from the S3 driver. We uh, we access the driver at startup. Just a, we we perform a mock uh, operation to load as as many classes as possible. Then they are um, they are how to call it snapshotted. Right, the entire virtual machine is snapshotted. And then load it to memory again, and this works well. Um, so uh, seems like if you're running a crack with Quarkus outside the cloud and you're using stock JDBC driver for Postgres, there are problems. So I didn't haven't tested it yet. Uh, the discussion you will find in the Discord. Maybe we should ping you know the Quarkus guys to say um, create an issue maybe, and 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 show this. But um, this is the snaps snaps uh, snapstart version. And this is what I'm using, and this works well. Um, so uh, the the Quarkus uh, and and this is so called priming. 
what priming means is you deploy the lambda and uh, in per availability zone the lambda is started and stopped and optimized and then the optimized image is distributed in the availability zone and availability zone is a data center basically and then at the next start it starts in half of a time uh, I don't um, exactly, and this is what you see here. This is what I talk about, and this is actually new in the documentation. So in the static, uh, in the static uh, block, uh, the DynamoDB client is loaded, with the, and exactly client described endpoints. This is like a mock operation to to load, you know, the internal classes. And what happens then? The more classes are loaded, the more classes are also then frozen on the on the on the fast plot. I wanted to say on the disk <laughs> in memory. And distributed in the availability zone. Okay. And by the way, the snapstart here you see this is this crack, but this is only the hook. Um, AWS doesn't actually implement the entire crack protocol. They they serialize or they optimize more than the than the crack. So and now the last one is the most fun. Um, is the time machine. And this is from 2015. And uh, um, the question is, do you see JavaScript frameworks in your work yet? Do you, <laughs> interesting, yes, I see now. <laughs> this is the change. Do you see MVVM, this is model view view model from Microsoft becoming popular? I think Angular implemented the first one, MVVM. Um, yeah. What's also interesting, you know, BCE back then. Uh-huh. Alex, you say so complicated with the crack, you mean? Uh, with crack is actually um, absolutely not complicated. What, uh, what with crack or with Snapstart and AWS, it is slow. So if you deploy the first time, it, it takes three times longer because it, it, it primes per availability zone. So I try to avoid Snapstart in, in development and we use it more in production or um, we started in integration, you know, because we have to know to 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 test it, and uh, and in production. But for multiple deployments a day, it is faster without snapshot or crack. So um, they asked me about BCE, and interestingly, um, I mean, I don't like to repeat the, this this question, but uh, what um, infrastructure as code, right? So uh, what I do, I code basically the cloud with Java as well. So you can go, for instance, to my GitHub account and you will fi find, for instance, Quarkus, I think the name is Quarkus CDK plane. And um, the CDK is Java code, so I also have to organize that. And I use uh, uh, the BCE as well, boundary control entity. And the um, and the question is, you know, how to organize it or how to name the packages? And I tried various things, but uh, I think the, the best one is I just picked the name of the service. So you will find an, an package DynamoDB, S3, Route 53, and, uh, and not DNS and persistence. It's easier to find. So um, I think BCE doesn't have to be always, you know, uh, doesn't have always used the, 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 the domain names. Sometimes it is even better, you know, to use, to use uh, uh, service names because this is what you search for later. Exactly, and and you know the we covered this multiple times. So what I will do is, I will date utils and mail service. I will put mail service in mail and date utils onto onto time and date and stuff stuff like that. Um, so also the question of DTO and REST is it okay? So actually uh, today we had a we had an architecture session. We talk about that, and I would say the more flexible your REST endpoint has to be, the uh, less the, the least interesting Java classes actually are. So in the in the more more challenging projects, we are using JSON P for that, right? JSON P means like the the, the hash map like structure. And of course, we have uh, Java records right now, which are really interesting. And uh, I think in future Java's, or I think it's very likely that in the future Java versions, we get a way to uh, to create new versions of uh, or how to call it. To have uh, not mutable rec records, but, but a way to efficiently create from one record a new one with different data. So, like efficient cloning or something like this. Okay, he's 21 years old, no more, like, 
uh, because now he is uh, almost nine years older, now 30, so almost retired, right? Uh, <laughs> and he would like um, to learn C sharp. So the question is interesting, right? After nine years, wouldn't be good choice back then to switch to C sharp? So the question is, in the last nine years, what is you know what happens to popularity of Java and what happens to pop popularity of C sharp? It would be interesting to compare, right? Uh, as my feeling is, Java gets more and more popular. C sharp, I don't hear a lot. What I hear a lot um, more, a little bit, is the .NET um, core, the open source version version version, is somehow popular. But C sharp, I hear less than nine years ago. But maybe this is just you know. My my echo chamber, so depends. Um, so, what's your opinion to chat? Is like C sharp C sharp popularity increase or decrease in the last nine years? Would be interesting uh, uh, to know. Um, okay, JDO is is uh, I think no one uses or no one uh, is like no more that popular. But as JPA, I would say JPA is still uh, very popular. I would say really popular. Actually, in, in lots of projects, uh, uh, JPA is used everywhere. The uh, interesting part is I don't use JPA at all in the last three, four years, and the um, or, or since Corona, because I do more clouds, and in the clouds, is rela relational databases are just sometimes too expensive. So we have to use NoSQL no databases, and this is the only reason why we don't use JPA, but JPA is still great. So... Okay, this one, which CDI annotations available in GSPs? Um, I don't think this is, yeah, we, we can. So uh, where would you put interceptors? So the answers didn't change. Always put interceptors where they belong to. For instance, in one project, we have uh, interceptors for authentication. So there are then, you know, in auth package. Um, okay, unit testing is interesting. Um, so uh, what what we are doing, we are not using the Archelian frameworks. What we use instead, I use Quarkus almost everywhere, Quarkus test annotation. And what I also do in system tests, I'm injecting the microprofile REST client to the system test. Works actually really good. Um, oh, dynamic finders, I would say this will be more le like Panache. And um, the new Jakarta EE standard, NoSQL standard also has that. Um, so my reaction to the, uh, yeah, forgot to look at that up, but uh, Jürgen is a really nice guy, Jürgen Höhler, uh, is here in, in the near of Munich, actually. Um, okay, so, uh, we can skip the Wi-Fi question. We can also skip the Angular JS because it's uh, no more almost alive. So this is also how to test two microservices where one communicates with the second via REST. So um, currently in my project, we do this in system tests and we even have a multi-system tests um, where uh, uh, a system test talks to two microservices. The, uh, the only challenge is what to do in unit tests because if you, or integration tests, because if you would like to, to, to talk to one microservice and it needs the other one and you don't have it, so you will have to simulate, emulate, or mock it somehow. Huh. Yeah, Alex, what you said, that Java is a pure, poor language, use C++. I think the advice would be not that bad, because with C++, you learn more, and then you can always do Java, right? So I would say I also liked uh, C++, and I really liked, I have to admit, the book, by Björn Strustrup, I forgot, from Edison West, the thick book. I really enjoyed it. I don't know why. I really like C++ also because it was compl complicated. It was for me a challenge. I really enjoyed, you know, playing with all the C in, C outs and templates. So, uh, and uh, yeah, but, uh, and I actually, if I would have a little bit more time, I would still do C++ just for fun. But um, yeah, but uh Java is just too popular. So maybe in 10 years, you know, if it, uh, the popularity decreases, maybe then I can do something different. Okay. 
Okay, this Ozark. Oh, also interesting. This uh, model view controller Ozark is like was the um, reference implementation back then. What also will affect Java E and JSPs and Ozark. You know what? String templates, which are currently in preview. I think if we get string templates, it is it 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 will be. I think a really great for uh, server side rendering SSR, and uh, you could have you know a string templates which will parse, for instance, SQL query and validate the queries against databases in real time. I think string templates will be huge. Hope they will come soon. Uh, yeah, uh, cleaning memory in C++ will remember what destructors, right? So this was the holy grail. Um, so could Jenkins and Docker, also interesting. We don't use Jenkins anymore. Also, why not? Because of costs. So we server, serverless build. Um, Oh, this this one is also interesting. So, can you provide an example of how to send text to cell phone from web application? And actually, remember what I answered back then. I said we need a kind of a gateway to do that, and the classic is SNS. So, with SNS, you can actually use. We had it earlier. We can use with SNS the um, we can send or we can use SNS to send SMS. <laughs> use SNS to send SMS exactly. Um, and uh, when to, uh, when to use um, when using JSF? Okay, backing beans, forget it. But uh, what I just wanted to say in one one of my, my project, we still use JSF, and the developers like it. So it's not like JSF is dead. The problem is more, you know, JSF has state. You have to configure JSF to be stateless, and this is a little bit problematic sometimes. And for highly interactive projects, um, you will have to use Fed Client, right? Which is basically web components in browser. So we are done. If you like, see you at the um, at the workshops. At uh, and the first one would be you already had, you know, the condensed version of it. So we we'll, we will uh, spend time with OpenID Connect, OAuth, Cognito, Application Load Balancer. Maybe Lambda authorizes. Let's see uh, roles and cross account communication stuff like that. And serverless Java patterns is like to how to build a monolith with serverless to save money, basically. But um, I think in both cases, we can focus more on code because uh, we had to know the last years was more theory and I think I can code more. Let's see. So this was that. And of course, if you would like to find the projects, whatever, there's a, a perfect <laughs> funny site is Airhex Industries. And this Airhex Industries are all the links uh, to GitHub. And if you like to Discord and uh, the Java shorts. So this was a uh, yeah, fun little domain. Ah, Carlos says, uh, hi, Adam. I have to present the next Tuesday in uh, Jakarta in Spanish. And how to control so for example, IP. Um, you mean you can run? On Quarkus AWS, okay. If you do it on AWS in uh, with MicroProfile using Metrics, Grafana, and Prometheus, okay. On if you would like to do it in AWS, you can do the same because you get managed Grafana and managed Prometheus. The problem is it's going to be a little bit more expensive. And the quick hack is use CloudWatch EMF embedded metrics format, the spe spe specific log format. If you do this. Uh, um, the uh, CloudWatch will parse the uh, the metrics, and uh, it you don't have to run your own Prometheus server and your own Grafana server. So this would be an indirect, you know. But cool that you present. So greeting to the Jakarta community. I have to apologize. I was invited to the Jakarta one stream, but I forgot to submit the CFP. So this is the first time which I will not attend the Jakarta one live stream. So Jakarta one is still great, but um, I was too lazy to submit a CFP. So this was problem. And there at EclipseCon, I apologize, but it was too late. The entire agenda was already you know set in stone. So next year I will I will know um, come again. But you know. We can still talk here, right? So uh, if you have questions, we can do here a small Jakarta One Airhex stream. So thank you. Time flies. Uh, the next is going to be the last Airhex in 2023 in December. So maybe some already with some snow in Paraguay, right? So thank you. And
see you next time. Bye.